4 verses 1 through 12, but before we can do that, we must first back up so that we keep everything in its proper context. And last week, we made our way through Luke 23 verses 44 through 56, and it's in those verses we read about the death and burial of Jesus. It is in those verses that Jesus is hanging on the cross. That this man, this God man, hanging there bleeding out, who no longer even looks human because the beating he took before he was nailed to that tree was horrendous. And we are told that it was around noon, that being the sixth hour, that the world goes black. The world goes black. And it stayed dark for three hours. So from 12 to 3, the sun was no longer in use as Jesus was dying on that cross. Why? It was during that time that, that God's wrath was being poured out upon the Son. The Savior, the very wrath that you and I so greatly deserve if you are in here today as a believer. Now many have wanted to say that from 12 to 3, when the world went black, that it was an eclipse. Now that's how you can explain this supernatural event. But, but church, we, we know that there was a full moon on the day of Passover. And you cannot have an eclipse when there is a full moon. It doesn't work that way. Again, this is God bringing his wrath onto his son. Now we know that it's towards the end of the three hours and, and, and the sun is starting to bring its light back into the world again that the world experiences an earthquake. I mean, the ground is shaking underneath them. If you, if you think about it, on that day the priest would have been in the temple courtyard slaughtering the lamb, sacrificing the lamb. And here it is, the ground shaking. And then they hear something from inside the actual temple. The veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place was being torn in two, top to bottom. What was the meaning behind that? Well, the most holy place was where in the first temple the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And after the, the first temple was destroyed, they kept the most holy place and the holy place separated. They no longer had the Ark of the Covenant, but inside the most holy place now, the walls were made of gold along with the floors. And some have even suggested that where the Ark of the Covenant would sit, there set a stone. And we know that there was only one time a year when the high priest would walk in to the most holy place and offer atonement for the Jewish people. But after what Christ did on the cross that day, there was no reason to separate God from the people. There was no longer a reason for man to have to go to the high priest. Christ is the perfect high priest. He is the perfect atonement. There's a reason why we no longer sacrifice animals. Because the perfect sacrifice was made that very day. So the veil's torn. No longer is there a barrier between God and man. It's because of Christ. Now man can go to directly to God. For Christ is the perfect intercessor. He is our pathway to him. And I'm going to say something that's offensive. But so what? It's the truth. What is it that Ben Shapiro says? Facts don't care about your feelings. 
You know what the word tells us? That there is only one way to God, and that's through the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's it. Bottom line. He's our intercessor. And it's here. While the earth is trembling, the veil has been torn in two. Christ is on the cross, and he cries out, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. For it was at that moment God's wrath had been fully poured out upon his son. For Jesus, the sinless one, completed the mission. Now the people there, they, they saw what was taking place. They they'd watched Christ from the moment he was nailed to that tree, hoisted up, dropped in that hole. From the time that the land went dark to it trembling. And now, there's no more life in him. He's hanging lifeless. And this is what's absolutely amazing. Because just moments after his death, we have the first Gentile come to believe. The centurion. Here he is. He, he's witnessed all of this. He's seen many of crucifixions. And normally what takes place as soon as they take that thief, lay him on the cross, drive that first spike into his wrist, cursing comes pouring out of his mouth. And then once he is up hanging on that cross, he is constantly yelling at the people. But not Jesus. From the moment he's nailed to the time the cross is standing upright, he is saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. No blame ever poured from the mouth of Jesus. The centurion, he's, he's watched all this. He's seen how Jesus has reacted this whole time. And that's when the centurion says, certainly, this man was innocent. And he began praising God. But we're also told, it's not just the centurion. His soldiers also believed Now, for the crowd of people that were there, the, the, the women who were believers and, and also John, that they were sitting here and, and now they're starting to think, what, what in the world are we going to do with the body of Jesus? You know, they weren't expecting this to happen. They thought he would go to trial and that would be it. But now here they are just hours later and he's dead. But God already had this covered. Joseph of Arimathea, a Sanhedrin, was a secret follower of Christ. And what does he do? Joseph, the secret follower, makes his way to Pilate. And he has Pilate, that being the Roman governor, can I have the body of Jesus? Can I take the body and give him a proper burial? Now we know that from the other Gospels, Pilate was shocked that Jesus was already dead. But he says, absolutely, you may have the body of Jesus. And we know that Joseph is extremely wealthy. And a wealthy man has a tomb that he is going to be buried in. So it's here that Joseph takes the body down from the cross and works his way to the tomb. Now, we're also told in other Gospels that Nicodemus, the Pharisee, another secret follower of Jesus, is there to help Joseph. So they wrap Jesus in fine linen and lay him in the tomb where they fulfill the prophecy of Isaiah 53, 9, where it says, And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. However, 
as they laid him in the tomb, time was running out. The Sabbath day was coming upon them, so they weren't able to give Jesus a proper burial. Meaning the Jewish people did not embalm the body. Instead, they would use spices and scents to help cover the smell when the body actually started to decompose. But they weren't able to do that. The Sabbath day was upon them, and they would have to wait to come back to give Jesus the proper burial. All right, let's pick up. First one. Okay. Verse one. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Okay, let me, let me say this before we go into this, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to take from some of the, the other three Gospels to make this story complete. Because what a lot of liberal theologians want to do, and in, anytime I say the word liberal, you guys know that's bad, right? Just so you, you get that. So the liberal theologians, what they want to do is they say when you take the four Gospels, they're not consistent. But they are, church. If you take four eyewitnesses and you place them in the courtroom, what are you going to say if they give the exact same account of the incident? Exactly. You're, you're going to sit there and you're going to look and say, something's wrong. They've gotten together. They put this story together. So what we are seeing here is a true eyewitness account. That's what the Gospels are. Written by men, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So again, here we go. This is going to be on a Sunday. That being the first day of the week, the day after the Sabbath. Just a little side note here. Just a little side note, and then we're going to dive into it. If we can go to Colossians 2, verses 16 through 17. I just want to say this, and this isn't popular either, either but I believe that Jesus actually fulfilled the Sabbath day. So if we look at Colossians 2, verses 16 through 17, it says, Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. So our rest lies in Christ. Okay, back to the story. Here we go. So it's, it's the ladies who are returning to the tomb. Now remember last week we said that they watched Joseph and Nicodemus lay Jesus' body in that tomb. We're often told, well, the reason why there was no one in the tomb is they went to the wrong one. Well, that's stupid. They're going to know where Jesus was laid. They're going to know the tomb. Again, they watched Joseph and Nicodemus lay him there. So they're returning back with their spices, ready to give Jesus a proper burial. Now they were getting there early in the morning because in the climate around that time, the body is going to decompose at a pretty fast rate. So early in the morning is when they are going. Now John tells us in his gospel that when Mary Magdalene she sees the tomb, and the stone has been rolled away. Now remember, they're also still feeling tremors. Earthquakes are still taking place. So the ladies get there, Mary sees the tomb rolled away, and she takes off. She, she's automatically assuming that someone has stolen the body of Jesus. Now the other ladies are still there. So by way of Mary taking off, heading back to the house, she does not see the angels. And that's extremely important. She doesn't see the angels, nor does she see the cloths lying where Jesus once was. So Luke continues to tell us about the other women who arrived to the tomb after Mary took off. Now look at verse 2. It says, And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Now, the discussion that would have been had between the women as they are walking there that morning, they'd have to be 
saying, well, hopefully the gardener's there. Hopefully the gardener's there, and he's going to be able to help us roll that stone away. Because the stone's heavy. So it would be difficult for them. Also, we need to understand, too, with that stone, it would have a groove in the ground. So even though it's heavy, it would make it somewhat bearable to move back and forth for them to enter. But if that was the first thing they noticed, if that was the first thing that Mary saw, then it means that the stone wasn't just rolled away in the groove, it was pushed away forcefully. So it was then the women would start walking slowly toward the tomb. There's something else that the women didn't think of, though. They didn't think about the guards who would be watching over the tomb. And yet when they arrived, there were no guards. Why? We're told in the other Gospels what took place. Once the earthquake started happening, the angels came down. One of the angels just pushes the stone away. The guards were so freaked out that they ended up passing out. And then when they came to, they saw the two angels still there, stone rolled away, and they took off. They wanted to go tell the authorities. Again, when the ladies got there, stone rolled away, no guards. So the women again entered. Look at verse 3. It says, but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. Okay, so, so think about this so far, okay? So far, we have had two guards who have witnessed the empty tomb. Two guards, they're gone. They became terrified, and they fled. We have Mary Magdalene. She saw the tomb was empty. I mean, the, ro the stone rolled away, so she's taken off. And we also have Joanna, the mother of James, will witness, along with Salome and Susanna, the empty tomb. So we have all of these eyewitnesses. That's a lot of eyewitnesses. So the tomb where Jesus was laid is wide open, but there is no body. There is no Jesus lying there. So the women at first are thinking, well, there can only be one explanation. Someone stole him. Someone stole Jesus. But that's not possible, church. One, it wouldn't make any sense. Why would anyone steal him? You think Pilate, the Roman governor, is going to have some of his soldiers go and take the body? Could you imagine if he did that and the Jewish people found out? There would be a revolt. He was scared enough of them revolting that he killed Jesus. So he's not going to mess with the body. He's going to keep it there. Now, why would the religious elite, the Sanhedrin, why would they go in and steal the body? That, that would only give affirmation that Jesus was who he said he was. Why would they want to prove that if people are thinking that he rose from the dead? So that doesn't make any sense. But then you have the disciples. They weren't going to steal the body. No, no, no. The women that followed Jesus, they were there to prepare the dead body. So stealing the body, it just, it's just dumb. So there's only one other option, right? Jesus fulfilled the prophecy. He rose from the dead. Now look at verse 4. So you can picture the women with their spices in hand, just standing there. And it's a perfect word. They were perplexed about this. I mean, the tomb's not huge. So in one scan, you can... 
see everything in there. Jesus isn't playing hide and seek. They're perplexed. And look at what it says. Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Now, Matthew and John describe these men as angels. Now, Luke confirms this by their dazzling apparel, meaning they were glowing like lightning bolts. And this is what we see all throughout Scripture. When it comes to man witnessing an angel, what are they doing? They are glowing. And why? Because they've been in the presence of God. Just being in his presence. They radiate light. So if they were perplexed before, now just imagine as these angels are sitting right here with them. Where did they come from? They weren't there a few moments ago. Look at verse 5. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground. Now this... And I think this would be a natural response. You're in a tomb expecting a body. The body's not there. Then all of a sudden you have two glowing people standing right beside you. But now, not only are these two angels just standing there with them, they also speak. And listen to what they say. The men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Now, this is a small rebuke here to the women, and rightfully so, because the angel is basically asking them, hey, you all were following Jesus. Did you not listen to his teachings? Did, did you not hear his words? And before the women could answer, the angel then reminds them of what Jesus taught. Look at verse 6. He says, he is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee, verse 7, that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. This is the prophecy of Jesus, that, that he would be killed and three days later, would rise. Now, of course, the women didn't grasp what Jesus was saying when he was actually saying this, or else they wouldn't be standing in an empty tomb with spices in hand. So I'm kind of giving the ladies a hard time. But let me say this about these women and this is extremely important because we need to remember who was with Jesus from the time of the last trial to when he was laid in the tomb it was the women who were the ones who fled the apostles not the women they stayed with Jesus they witnessed Pilate give in to the religious leaders They were there while Jesus was hanging and dying on the cross. It was the women who were there when Jesus died. And they were there when Joseph removed him from the tree. They were also there when his body was laid in the tomb. The women saw Joseph and Nicodemus put the body to rest. They saw it all. And then when they heard the angel say, remember how he told you in Galilee? It's then, now look at verse 8, that they remembered his words. And it just click. And as they're standing there in the tomb with spices in hands, the angels speak. They remember, they're like, we're out of here. They're going back to tell the apostles Look at verse 9. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Okay, this is extremely important here. Just so there's no confusion. 
on what Luke has done. Not all the men were in the room at the same time when the ladies came and told them. As a matter of fact, the ladies told them at different times. So what Luke has done is he's pretty much made this a concise statement. And and this is what I mean by that. Mary Magdalene, recall, she got to the tomb, saw the stone rolled away, and then she takes off back home. Who's in the house? John and Peter. So she tells John and Peter. What is it that John and Peter do? Someone stolen the body. So, listen, because this is extremely important. When Mary first told John and Peter, they did not believe that Jesus rose from the dead. No, instead, they take off to the tomb. Now, John, you got to love John. John's the athlete out of the apostles. Um, he, he's the kind of cocky one because he's the one that writes in his gospels that he outran Peter there. He didn't have to put that there, but he did. And then good for him for doing so. I mean, he's proud of his athletic ability that God gave him. So so there he is. So you have Peter and John, they're at the tomb. But notice who's not there when Peter and John get there. The women aren't there. Why? Because the women are starting to walk back towards the house. Now we have this little stupid idea in our heads that there's only one path to the tomb. Well, John lives in this region, so what does John know? The quickest ways to get there. So it very well could be the women were taking another path that John wasn't on, nor was Peter, and that's why they didn't cross paths with each other. All right, so the women are now walking back to the house. John and Peter are sprinting towards the tomb, and it's then that they look in, and it's John who believes that Jesus has rose from the dead. Okay, so just just remember that when someone wants to tell you, well, the Gospels all say something different. Luke tells us that the women tell the men the men don't believe. Well, how can that be? Because not all the men were in the room at the same time, nor were all the women. Well, this is the reason why. Again, Luke just consolidates the story. He doesn't give us every single detail. Luke probably would have been a really good pastor. He gets straight to the point. All right. So, what does Luke do next? Again, he just takes the story of the women. Look what he says right here in verse 10. Let's do it this way. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. You you see what he does there? He just lumps it all together. He doesn't say, well, Mary told uh, John and Peter and and then Salome came in and, and she told two more and three more. No, no, it's just all put together. So that there's no confusion. But yes, the women tell the same story, just different versions of it. Because Mary's saying, the tomb's empty. But then you have the other women come back and they said, well, not only is the tomb empty, his his linen cloths are just lying there. And then there's two angels in there telling us that he's rose from the dead. So that's how all of that adds up. Now look at verse 11. It says, But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. All right, so even though the women are are saying somewhat the same thing, whenever the apostles first heard it, they didn't believe it, which is why I said John and Peter, they didn't believe that he rose from the dead. And even when the other women came back with more information, the apostles still did not believe. Believe. And it's here in Luke's story, in his version, the condensed one, we see in verse 12, he says, But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. See, see, Luke doesn't even add John in his version. But John was with Luke. John believed, and Luke was just amazed. We know that Peter was dumbfounded when he looked in, much like the women were. There are those out there who will deny the resurrection. 
They will try to say that, again, the disciples stole the body, but we went through that. Others will say the Romans stole the bodies. We went through that. And others will say the religious elite stole the bodies, the body, but none of that makes any sense. What we have in the gospel, all four of them, are the facts. And the fact is this. Jesus was not in the tomb because he rose from the dead. Now here's the thing. Many people want to argue with facts because they're emotional. And that's fine. They can argue with the facts all day long, but that doesn't change the truth that Jesus rose from the dead. Most male theologians, the liberal ones, they're most of the time beta males anyway, so you don't really need to listen to them. But listen, let's say that you see the facts, you hear the facts, and you accept the facts. Does that make you a believer then? No. No, look at what Romans 10, 9 through 10 says. And I say that because just because someone can go through the Gospels and say that, okay, well, maybe Jesus did, maybe he rose from the dead. I'll give you that. But does that make them a Christian? No. This is how one is a believer. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That's who a true believer is. See, there can be people out there that will say, yeah, maybe, maybe Jesus rose from the dead. But that doesn't mean that those people follow Christ. It, it doesn't mean that they love the laws of God. It doesn't mean that they hate their sins and they want to turn from them. No. See, a true believer believes, yes, that Christ rose from the dead. And because of that, because the Holy Spirit regenerated that person's heart, not only do they hold to the resurrection, but they hold to the entire counsel of God. They love his word. They want to follow his commands. They hate sin. But they also know that by what Christ did on the cross that day, the sin that they have committed has been wiped free. He paid their sin debt in full. And because of that, you want to please the Father, you want to please the Son, and you love having the Holy Spirit dwell inside you. Church, that is a true believer. Let us pray.